Hi, everyone. Welcome today to the San Antonio Book Fair. Nice to have you all join us. We are super excited to be talking with authors Cynthia Lytic Smith and Christine Day today about Ancestor Approved, Intertribal Stories for Kids, a beautiful anthology, and possibly some um, of their future work. So before we get started, I would just like to say that we hope you'll consider purchasing Cynthia and Christine's books from the Book Festival's bookseller at the end of today's talk. You can just click on the Buy the Button uh, link on the festival site. And also, please know before we get started that we would love to hear from you. So please place your questions in the Q&A box for our authors. And before we close the event, we'll use the last 10 minutes or so um, to have those questions answered for you, okay? Um, and now I'm just gonna read a few bios for the authors. Um, Cynthia Lytic smith is the best-selling acclaimed author of books for all ages, including Rain Is Not My Indian Name, Indian Shoes, Jingle Dancer, and Hearts Unbroken which won the American Indian Library Association's Youth Literature Award. She is also the anthologist of Ancestor Approved, Intertribal Stories for Kids, and most recently she was named the 2021 NSK Newstad Laureate. Cynthia is the author curator of Heart Drum, a native focused imprint at Harper's Collins Children's Books and she serves as the Catherine Patterson Inaugural Endowed Chair on the faculty of the MFA Writing Program in Writing for Children and Young Adults at Vermont College of Fine Arts. She's a citizen of the Muscogee Nation and lives in Austin. And you can visit her website online at www.cynthialydicksmith.com. Christine Day is Upper Skagit. She grew up in Seattle nestled between the sea, the mountains, and the pages of her favorite books. Her debut novel, I Can Make This Promise, was a best book of the year from Kirkus, School Library Journal, NPR, and the Chicago Public Library, as well, as well as a Charlotte Huck Award honor book. She holds a master's degree from the University of Washington, where she created a thesis on Coast Salish weaving traditions. Christine lives in the Pacific Northwest with her husband. Welcome, ladies. So excited to have you both. Why don't we get started by having you both talk a little bit about your involvement with Ancestors Improved and what the genesis for that project was. I'll go ahead and dive in and then Christine can join me. I'm sure she'll have a lot to add. Uh, the original genesis for Ancestor Approved really came out of need. I was always very mindful of depictions of Native people and Native voices and books for young readers at each of the age market levels. That's picture books, middle grade, young adults, and a few smaller categories in between. One year, I, I believe it was 2017, I was on a blog called American Indians and Children's Literature and in a chart that broke down representation to age level, the only middle grade representation was for one short story by Choctaw author Tim Tingle. It was in Flying Starts, edited by Ellen O from We Need Diverse Books. And that's one book for all of middle grade with native representation. And it wasn't even an entire book. It was just one, don't get me wrong, it was excellent, but one of many short stories. And the reason that it was in the body of literature at all was because we had this wonderful nonprofit organization. We Need Diverse Books that had really dedicated itself to raising quality representation on the page and among creatives. That said to me that as someone who is a short story lover, someone who has a strong background in contemporary Native fiction for young readers, it was time to sort of take the conversation to the next level. So I made a list of existing writers for young readers who were very well, a few that were very well established, like Joseph Bruchak and Eric Gansworth, some that were quickly up and coming, like Christine Day and Tracy Sorrell, as well as some brand new voices. 
at the time would be Andrea Rogers and Brian Young. Uh, both Andrea and Brian have since then had, um, Andrea's first book is out, Mary and the Trail of Tears, and Brian's is forthcoming, Healer of the Water Monster. So, you know, these were writers who were new voices on the verge. And we decided that we would center a collection around a two-day intertribal powwow. And the intertribal powwow was chosen because it would be a natural venue for intertribal diversity. Kids from a lot of different nations coming together, some traveling long distances, some being local, some not necessarily even having a direct connection to the powwow, but being local. And that was a fascinating process. You know, I reached out to writers who said, Sin, this sounds like so much fun and I would love to work with all these people, but I'm not from a powwow family or I'm not from a powwow tribe. And my answer to that was terrific because that representation is important too. The last thing I want is for someone to put down this book, a collection of short stories centered on a powwow and think, oh, I know what native people do, they powwow. That wasn't the idea. The idea was simply to have a linchpin event wherein we can have intersectional meetings and an array of experiences represented on the page. From there, we worked together on an online, on a Trello message board. We shared uh, world building information. We were in contact with the tribal planners. Tracy Sorrell, who is one of our contributors, was a team member who took point on that. We had a map of the high school where the power takes place. I, I called the uh, the hotel that was set up for vendors at a discount rate to find out what they served for breakfast. So if anyone had breakfast in the story, it rang true to the experience of those folks at the real life powwow. And that real life powwow was Dance for Mother Earth in Ann Arbor, Michigan. It is a real event. And we chose Michigan specifically for a couple of questions. One, it was a more natural venue to bring down some First Nations folks from the north. That Canadian US border is not necessarily our border. That is the border of the United States and Canada. We wanted to make it very clear that these relationships crossed that and also plausible that it would make sense to young readers that this particular group of kids would come for the reasons that were expressed in the story. I'll, I'll pitch over to Christine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and that, is such, that is such a great sort of summary of how it all of how you really brought us all together and it really was um i mean this book is a celebration of a celebration right it is it really does show so much diversity of contemporary native experiences um so when cynthia reached out to me and you know had this pitch for this great powwow themed anthology which would have poems and short stories from all these different talented folks. Um, at the time, I was in grad school. And so um, since this powwow is associated with the University of Michigan, I, that really resonated with me. And I was just like, wow, I would love to um, write a sort of sister story um, in celebration of the celebration and also just to sort of reflect what it looks like when a little sister my main character riley goes to visit her older sister who is now a college student at the university of michigan her name is brooke and um how the relationship has sort of changed now that they're not living together anymore and now that they're both sort of going through um these kind of growing moments apart from each other and how are they going to also stay together and hold on to their relationship as sisters? So um, that was what I sort of brought. And I had so much fun writing the short story and sort of coming up with these relationships and thinking too about how to make it specific to the Coast Salish region where I'm from in the Pacific Northwest. For example, as Cynthia kind of pointed out, um, my characters, they are not wearing the same sort of like fancy dance regalia or like the regalia that you might sort of expect to see in a powwow. They are wearing like cedar woven hats and um, these woolen shawls, which are traditional to this area. And um, they are just sort of, you know, there's a mention that their father is speaking the shoot seed, which is 
one of the like native languages that is traditional to Western Washington state. So I really wanted to make it very tribally specific and regionally specific and yet bring that to this event that is happening in Michigan. And I had a lot of fun thinking through all those things and just sort of having fun with it. It was such a fun, such a fun project. Thank you. Um, yeah, the stories in the anthology, um, they have such a deep point of view, each of them. That was one of the things that impressed me about it. And aside from, um, I love the way Cynthia talked about looking for representation from different tribes and characters that had very many different feelings about being mm -hmm. at a powwow, um, with some of the characters um, being more familiar, like it's a homecoming, they're, they've been there many times, their family has been a part of the powwow circuit forever, to others uh, who have, it's their first experience, they're a little afraid, excited, not sure if they're going to fit in. And I love that that diversification was part of the goals of the book um, in terms of representation. I'm wondering if you could tell us what the reaction has been to the book, perhaps from kids. Have you heard from kids who have read it? Or another part of that question, it's a two-part question. One might be to think of yourselves when you were children and what sort of stories shaped you as young readers and what a book like this might have meant to you as a child. Oh my goodness, so many layers to the question. Um, first, I, I will point out because I should congratulate Christine for her part of this, that the book has received uh, four starred reviews, is a junior library goal, uh, gold selection, and we are certainly hearing from especially teachers who are delighted to have short stories that they can use with their classes in a way that, you know, both may touch on curriculum and representation, but also are just page turning reads unto themselves. Uh, with that said, we are just now starting to get feedback from kids, some of it directly, some of it through again, those teachers, our parents, and, you know, much of what we're hearing is where they find with Native kids, the mirrors of themselves. And it doesn't necessarily have to be someone in which a character which directly represents them, it could be that they are finding themselves along one of the intersections. When I'm thinking about uh, young readers and how to best craft culturally grounded material so it will resonate, I think of it in terms of a tree ring with the children most directly represented at the center, those at the various intersections out, but all child readers somewhere in that circle. So, when I'm talking about those intersectional readers, those next out, it might be, oh, you know, in, in the case of my story, um, between the lines, someone said, oh, I read this and I, I, I'm a lot like Ray. My grandfather is a veteran, too. And he was in, you know, this branch of the military and we go, you know, out for day trips together. It, it might be someone from a different tribe, but they might see themselves in that history of military service in a family. They might see themselves in an intergenerational relationship. And so they will connect with the idea of native plus these other qualities, even if they're not Cherokee Seminole per se. Or you could have kids who are non-native and you know they may have another connection um, or it might just have, it sort of tickles their sense of humor. I was so delighted to hear from a non-native child about uh, Tim Tingle's story, Warriors of Forgiveness. And it's a very humorous story. Um, it's about a young boy who journeys with a busload of elders up from Oklahoma to Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is a bit of a hike, but um, they, so they have various adventures along the way and their faith might be a bit tested, but it is in, in time redeemed as we, you know, sometimes have difficult moments and forgive each other and one another. And, you know, the, the young reader said, this was so funny to me. I was sending all the lines that were funny to me and they were non-native. And some of those lines were what struck me as particularly Indian humor, chopped off humor, Tim's, sense, Tim's wacky sense of humor. And I thought this is terrific because that is kind of the last barrier. It's really important that we have three-dimensional um, humanity in stories about all people, including native people, that we are pushing back against a sort of stoic two-dimensional uh, curriculum, paper dolls or stereotypes with these fully actualized characters. 
But even as we're looking for those connections, often humor is the last one that really clicks because humor is so idiosyncratic. Everyone can agree on what's really sad, but what's funny can vary from person to person. And I just feel like through more exposure, we'll have a better understanding of each other. And, you know, if we can laugh together across tribal lines, across cultural lines, and see our sense of humor reflected in books, we're really coming to a better place as a community of readers. Yeah. Christine, you're closer yeah. to being a young reader than I am. Do you want to talk about that piece of it, the books that you did or didn't get to read? Oh man, yeah, my I am just so, <laughs> it's interesting because, so recently I have been reading your upcoming book, Sin, Sisters of the Never Sea, oh which we haven't really gotten into <laughs> yet, but we need to discuss. So, <laughs> and I was, um, one thing, I don't want to say anything. Yes. Oh, this book is coming out June 1st. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Yes. Art by, oh, I should say this. Cover art by Floyd Cooper, Muskogee, illustrator. Yes. Oh, man. It is an incredible book, first of all. And second of all, something that um that I really love that was just a little nod that you did I don't want to say anything to spoil the book or anything like that don't worry I will not but I will say that the reference Ella enchanted in this book which was a book that I really loved growing up and I was just making that connection and thinking about how you know that is another one of those stories like you have been sort of reinventing Peter Pan, this is a Peter Pan retelling from an indigenous perspective, and it is so fun and magical and does a lot of the things that you're talking about with the sense of humor and um, just having this really interesting layered read for kids that is also like totally tackling so many stereotypes around what it means to be native or what it means to be a girl or what it means to just be a person in the world really and so um i was thinking about that and how um you know ella enchanted is a retelling of cinderella that similarly you know has a lot of humor and sort of takes this like age-old story and reinvents it for like new and younger generations and how those it continues to translate and it continues to just sort of be these great stories that do a lot of cross-cultural work i think and do a lot of sort of kids just connect with them so much and so um yeah not entirely sure where i was going with that but i just think that there's something really powerful <laughs> about about <laughs> about sort of taking a lot of these familiar tropes and familiar stories and turning them over a little bit and infusing them with a new sense of humor or a new perspective or something that kids are just going to really enjoy reading but then it's also going to be doing this kind of sneaky work of undoing stereotypes and pushing against some like some of the things that we did not have before right introducing these ideas and so um yeah i think that that's pretty cool and i think that heart drum is such a it there, we're going to see so many great stories come out of heart drum that do all that work all at once I, i'm so honored that you said that <laughs> we're so excited that your voice is in the mix i, I know his sisters in the never see I, I really thought that, you know, J.M. Barry's mythology could use a solid infusion to kick an indigenous <laughs> perspective. Uh, and, but, you know, beyond that, when, when you were a kid, were, do you remember you talked about Ella and related to mm -hmm. what was there a right. native book that you gravitated to that resonated with you? Because I didn't really have one. I, my, my childhood book was, um, which of Blackbird Pond, I read it regularly. And, you know, it was uh, set in Puritan New England. Mm. Kit Tyler is their newly orphaned from Barbados with her very uh, buttoned up auntie and uncle. And she's 
defying uh, cultural expectations and conventions over time. She's teaching uh, a black child that she befriends how to read and they have a wonderful friendship. She allies herself with an elder woman who is a religious outcast from that Puritan society. She's tried for witchcraft. I don't know, maybe I thought if I lived in Puritan New England, I would have been tried for witchcraft. That seems likely to me. Uh, any of those things <laughs> are possible. But, um, you know, I, I I didn't have that heart book and I even backed away. Mm. Sometimes if I saw Native characters on the cover, thinking even though that was supposed to be representing one of my identity elements that was, you know, integral, that I might be somehow um, disappointed or not have the connection that one might hope. What, what, what was your experience? If you don't mind Deborah, oh. me asking her, I just really want to yeah. know. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So um, that's totally true. And I think that I, when I was a kid, so I sort of grew up semi-connected, not really entrenched in my native, with my native family or my native community. And so I think that I was constantly looking for native representation somewhere and I think that it was often very confusing for me <laughs> is maybe the like um maybe that's the right word to use because so much of it like so I grew up there was this book I really really loved Walk Two Moons when I was a kid and that is one of those books that was written by a white woman that has this ambiguously native character. It's not affiliated with any real tribe. Um, her name is Salamanca, which is supposed to be, I think, the name of her tribe, which is, you know, maybe she like meant Seneca or something. I don't know. But um, it has a lot of, it's not real native representation right it is this sort of new agey interpretation that is sort of romanticized of what it means to be a native person and to be sort of connected to some idea of the land or um spiritual ceremony or something because of some of the scenes that were in there and so it's interesting because I remember really loving that book and rereading it a lot but I feel like it was also very misleading and I feel like it was not a book that actually gave me what I was looking for which was something real and tangible and something that really reflected um you know my experience or the experience of the people that I know in my life including like my mother and my sister, you know. Um, so that was one example. Uh, another book, I think the closest thing I had, oh, before I go to like a good example, here's another one that um, I read as a teenager that was one of those books that really defined me as a reader, which was Twilight. <laughs> I loved Twilight very very much when I was like 15 I got it for Christmas and, and that is one of the books that I probably read like most I I was glued to it I reread it like four or five times during my teen years easily and um it's interesting because there's some really weird things that happen with the native rep in Twilight I think that there are some kind of profound things like for example um the fact that the native folks are the only ones who know that the colons are dangerous vampires and that they tell them to stay off of their land and that that is something that they remember that the white folks of forks have sort of forgotten that they don't have that memory of just how dangerous they are and to me i think that there's a lot of things that can actually be said about maybe the vampires being a metaphor for missionaries or for colonizers especially since the like patriarch of the Cullen family is literally named Carlisle. I don't know. <laughs> so to me, I think that there are some really interesting things that maybe she was trying to do with that story. But at the same time, um, you know, it, when you revisit the films or you visit the books and you see these really sort of, um, you know, the, the teen, 
native boys who turn into wolves and how that's like this you know they don't have control over it and there's kind of a lot of loaded things going on with the representation that way um and how the Quileutes they are a real native nation here in the pacific northwest and their sort of traditional stories were just sort of swept aside for a white author to create her own werewolf mythology for them that's another it's a complicated situation all around with this story there's a lot of different things kind of going on all at once but for me when i was a teenager and um i was lonely and insecure and totally identified with bella swan and it was set in this like environment that felt so familiar to me and i loved all the descriptions of the greenery and the rain and i was just so into this sort of gothic feel of it and the emphasis on the emotions and on um this sort of relationship which i think is more of a tragedy than a romance but that's a conversation for another thing i'm really going too hard with the twilight right now but <laughs> those were the really like those are the two like books that i feel like I love so much at really specific points in my life and I sometimes wonder like you know what that really means for because they are really sort of messy with representation. The only book that I can think of that was like a native written sort of native story that I loved as a kid was Skeleton Man. Mm. That was the only one that I really had access to I think that I remember thinking that it was really it, you know kind of dark and fascinating and I remember like the descriptions of skeleton man like sucking the flesh off of his bones and stuff <laughs> and like it was like a really great book and I do remember that one but that's really all I remember having access to I think it was by it. Joseph Bruchak by yeah, Bruchak yes referenced... thank you you referenced it in your um cynthia references it in her story she does and, she does uh, yes one of the things that i loved about uh, what you said is that you bring your indigenous perspective even to your reading and what i heard mm -hmm. both of you talk about when you talk about um cross-cultural work and indigenous perspectives in your writing and what you strive to do with this anthology. And even in Christine, Christine, in your story in Ancestor Approved, really you're writing about reciprocity between you and your sister, mm -hmm. the notion that a littler girl can help educate and teach her older sister vice, you know, in exchange for what the older teacher uh, sister has taught her is such an indigenous concept. And so it yeah. sounds like what you're doing in, in many ways is educating, you're writing for native kids, but you're also writing for mainstream culture and showing them what we as native people have to offer in unique knowledge and unique perspectives about the world. And I'd love to jump to this mention that Cynthia made, that Heart Drum, which I'd love to hear her talk a little about the, uh, the history and the founding of Heart Drum. You're coming out with Brian Young's Healer of the Water Monster, I understand very soon. And I'm wondering if you could say, um, or maybe talk about Heart Drum, but also in particular with books like The Healer of the Water Monster, um, Native people are really jumping in now to um, fantasy. And for us, I'm not sure that it's um, fantasy in the same way that um, other writers have taken fantasy on. And whether or not you think that the Indigenous perspective is um, suited to it and will expand in that particular field uh, would be something I might love to hear you talk about. So as I mentioned, Heart Drum is a native focused imprint of HarperCollins children's books. And we create books for children and teens by native creatives. And that also includes, say, cover artists, voice actors. Um, the teacher who's writing our guide is they, you know, it's it's a comprehensive effort, and we're learning our way as this is sort of a, if you will, a rebirth in Native children's literature. There was a time um, during the multicultural movement going up through the late 1990s where there were voices like Shanta Bugay and Lucy Tapahanso and Joy Harjo and Gail Ross 
um, Michael LaCava, creating some really beautiful, especially picture books for young readers. And then in the industry, what was called the multicultural boom sort of went bust for a few years. Part of that was the recession and part of it was a sort of pullback to single voices of representation. In our case, uh, for Native writers, that was largely Joe Bruchak for children. And it wasn't Joe doing it. He actually founded a publishing house to try to get more Native voices published. But there were many years there when we couldn't um, connect in the marketplace the way that we are now. So this is a time of tremendous hope of celebration, of community cooperation. And as we're looking at the development of representation books for young readers, BPIC, POC books in particular tend to follow a particular trajectory. First, we see retellings of traditional stories. And then we see historicals, usually about landmark events. So um, the Trail of Tears, the Japanese internment, um, anything, you know, the civil rights movement and then we see larger historical fiction more daily life historical fiction then we see contemporary fiction rooted in social justice issues like activism or um some sort of gender rights kind of conversation and then broader contemporary fiction like daily life fiction so judy bloom kind of fiction right and from there the we start to see kind of two categories one is collaborative works where you might see intersectional collaboration. I'm doing a book with uh, Kekla Magoon, who is a multiple Coretta Scott King and National Book Award finalist author. And we're doing little girl uh, superheroes from a black and native family, each bringing our part of that collaboration to craft that family. And you're part of that superheroes, right? That is a quintessential form of American fantasy. That is arguably our contribution for better and worse, to the storytelling tradition over time when we think about ourselves as citizens of the United States. We have brought superheroes. Um, so why not do a family of Native and Black superheroes? But speculative fiction in general, superheroes, um, that, which can be science fiction or fantasy, sometimes a little bit of both, uh, as well as other genre fiction like mystery, that's always the last step. And that's unfortunate because a lot of kids are speculative fiction kids mm -hmm. that's what gets them excited about reading if you look at ancestor approved you will find a remarkable number of references in passing to star wars and that is because if, and i say this with love indigenous people we are geeky peoples that is one of the few things that i will say is not a stereotype it is pretty much true of everybody we all have some kind of geekdom and <laughs> so we're you know when we look at our body of literature where are those books where are those geeky books that for the indigenous, right? Where 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 do they see themselves on the page? We have to get there. The question is, how do we get there? What's the best way to get there? What's the most culturally competent way to get there? Now, I can do a retelling. These two books, if you look at them, are kind of interesting. Here, I have walked in to essentially Barry's world. I figure he put indigenous characters in there. He had some things to say about girls. And he invited me in. So I came right in and I continued that conversation. This is an intrinsically Navajo book, specifically Navajo. Brian Young is a debut author. He's a young author. And he spent countless years, I think it was seven or eight years, in conversations with elders. What is okay to share? What is not okay to share? He took things in and out. He ran drafts by. He had a community consensus. He was deferential. He took no for an answer. And that was extremely important to him, that his culture was part of our artistic, our artistic tradition, but it is not a commodity that can be bought and sold casually as though it doesn't matter. This is a gift to children, but it's also specifically a gift to Navajo children. And if you look at the review in the Navajo Times, which just came out, that is in some ways, you know, it was very positive. It's a validation. It talked a lot about the protocols that he pursued and the importance to him in moving along that trajectory. Not every Native author is going to feel comfortable going there at all. It was mentioned earlier, I have a book um, for young adults called Hearts and Broken. And I won't tell you what it is, but there is one line that suggests ceremony for the family that will resonate. Muskogee readers will recognize it. They have written, written me to say they recognize it, but it will fly under the radar for anyone else. And you can do that. You can not erase 
the three dimensional um, lived spiritual experience of your characters and still do it in such a way that it, it, it remains private. Uh, Debbie Reese, who is a scholar, she runs the blog I mentioned earlier, American Indians and Children's Literature, talks about curtains. And that's building on a prior metaphor mm -hmm. from Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop, the mother of multicultural children's literature. Uh, Dr. Bishop said that books can act as windows, mirrors, or sliding glass doors, that they can allow children to see themselves reflected and invite themselves into the conversation of books, that they can create bonds by in, uh, fostering empathy and understanding, and that through the sliding glass doors, they can invite readers in. At the same time, Reese adds to that, that sometimes there are certain subjects wherein curtains is appropriate to the metaphor. That while there are certainly stories we share, there are also stories that we keep private and in community. The navigation of that is gonna be idiosyncratic to every creative, their individual nation and culture, their relationship to tradition, their elders, and how that ultimately makes sense on the page. But I believe that at least in my immediate circle of conversation, there is um, a real devotion and a lot of conversation about when we move forward, when we don't move forward, and our reasons for doing so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a question from Kristen who has asked, how did you choose the Ann Arbor dance for Mother Earth powwow? Ironic and sad the event had to be canceled due to COVID-19. Can't wait to read the anthology. Uh, thank you, Kristen. I hope you enjoy the anthology. I, I did mention that we had we selected a powwow up north because we wanted to make it much more um, feasible, likely, a plausible that First Nations folks would also be traveling to it as well as those from tribes within. Uh, the borders of the United States. As, but you know, as you may be thinking, there is a lot of land from coast to coast. So why did I land on Ann Arbor specifically? And that's for a couple of reasons. First, it was a powwow that is linked to university community. And university communities intrinsically have more diversity, and that includes more native diversity. You're more likely to have native students there as graduate students. You're more likely to have kids involved from the Native Students Association in Pow Wow, it just opens up the opportunity of more likelihood for the representation we were looking for than if it had been in a town that was not a college town or a major metropolitan area. The second reason is entirely personal. I'm a graduate of the University of Michigan Law School. I was, in, I was involved in the Native Law Students Association there. I was actually president. It was a real power position. There were six of us. I, I got the job because I had gotten an A in First Amendment and the dean taught First Amendment. So they're like, let's have Sin do it because he likes her. And so we'll be able to get more programming through or something like that. But um, so I, I had a picture of Ann Arbor in my mind and an understanding of it. Most uh, of the books, actually, my books are all set in places where I've lived. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I do believe that when we're talking about representation and diversity, and oftentimes people will talk about major identity elements, like like we are, like tribal affiliation, um, race, culture, faith, body type, orientation. There is also a, a diversity of region. Each city mm -hmm. has a character. Each part of the continent has a vibe. It, it's It's one thing to set something in the upper Midwest or the Great Lakes region, something else to set it in the Pacific Northwest or the Southwest. And so I'm mindful of those aspects too when I'm crafting story. I think, you know, when we talk to someone, we say, um, I know where you're coming from. And what that expression means is I understand you. And I think that that speaks to how important setting is. That knowing mm -hmm. a place means in some ways knowing a people and understanding where they're gathering if they are coming as visitors. Totally. Wonderful. Um, Christine, I was wa wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you have upcoming in your, uh, what you're working on and how it's been, um, oh, yeah. how your writing practice has changed um, during the pandemic. Yeah, thank you. So recently, my second book, did come out in January is called The Sea in Winter. And I love what Sin, just really quick, I love what Sin just said about 
being regionally specific as well, because I do think I am such a Pacific Northwest writer. <laughs> I think that um, I have a hard time. I've always lived here. I love this place. And I, pretty much all of the work that I do almost is set here because it really is what I know. And I think that there's so many like rich places and histories and the cultural aspects to explore here that I understand really well and I love to explore. So this one is another one that is set here in the Pacific Northwest. It is about um, a young girl named Maisie who is a serious young ballet student and she has injured her knee which has taken her out of her ballet studio and away from her closest friends there and she is going on a midwinter road trip with her family as she is healing. So that's what this one is about. And um, up next, later this year, I am going to, I am in the She Persisted chapter book series, which contains these books so far. So this is inspired by Chelsea Clinton's best-selling picture book which was about 13 incredible women who persisted in some way. And she is expanding this sort of brand out to include different uh, women writers to write longer biographies about each of these women who were featured in the original book. And these four have already come out. There is a release each month throughout the year with two releases coming in December. And in November, you will see my book about Maria Tallchief, which I am so thrilled and honored to write because Maria Tallchief was the first great American prima ballerina. And she was also an Osage woman who lived this incredible, rich, full life. And I just love the idea of introducing young readers to this Native woman who broke so many barriers in the dance world. Who she was the first American ball ballerina to perform on stages in Paris and in Russia. And um, the a lot of famous American ballets, including the Nutcracker, were actually made specifically for her, the Sugar Plum Fairy and Nutcracker. She was the first person to dance that role for George Balanchine. And so um, I did ballet growing up and I learned about her when I was a kid. And so the fact that I was able to write her biography was really like a full circle moment in my life. And that's my next thing that I have coming out. Awesome, thank you. Andrew is asking where um, they can find the books that were mentioned today. And um, there is um, a book festival bookseller um, that you can find the link on the website too. And, you know, independent bookstores have had a hard time during the pandemic. So we would love if you could help support them and these writers and the festival by purchasing through the festival's website. So just click on the buy the book button on the festival site. And I want to thank Cynthia and Christine for speaking with us today. I'm left with a feeling of grace and fullness, and I admire so much the generosity that the two of you bring to the page and that you help other writers uh, bring to the page, because I do feel that um, Indigenous people have so much to offer the world and that the world is hungry for perspectives that mm. are um, strong and indigenous and that have a value system that is a little different than what we see in the mainstream world. So your work mm -hmm. is very important and I thank you very much. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Madame, my friend, thank you.